Hey everyone, it's Professor Howard. So this time around, what I want to talk about is when we're examining human behavior as a phenomenon of interest, what does that mean for us as scientists? And we have kind of a difficult time because when we're talking about understanding human behavior, when we're trying to understand people, we come steeped in this history. We have cultures where we learn that people behave a certain way because of certain reasons. And it can sometimes be difficult to approach that from an empirical or scientific perspective. So what I want to talk about this time around is what does it mean to be a scientist of people, to be a scientist who understands uh, the behavior of people from an epistemological perspective. So I want to begin here by talking about this, the levels of scientific understanding so that we can then see how psychology and behavior analysis fit within that larger domain of sciences. When we're talking about science, we're talking about the stuff of the, the scientific method. We're talking about a principle. And if we are considering psychology as a whole, as a field of study about people, of behavior and mental processes, and we want to understand that, then we know that psychology is a science because it shares a lot of characteristics with other types of sciences. So sciences in general have very precise and careful measurement. We want to understand the phenomenon of interest. We as scientists are committed to repeated experimentation, which means we find a way to ask questions. We formulate hypotheses. We want to understand what's going on with that particular phenomenon. And we do that experiment again and again and again under different experiences, under slightly different circumstances to see how universal is a principle. How universal does that rule hold true? And we also want to make sure that as scientists, we're always exposing ourselves to peer review, where we actually show other people our methodology, show them our results, and invite them to give us feedback about what we've done in a way to improve the way that we ask questions in the future. The whole reason that we have this scientific method, the whole reason we approach uh, understanding people from a scientific perspective is because we know that we have very personal biases about people and the way that people function. So we want to make sure that as a science, we're trying to minimize our personal biases about a principle, about the phenomenon of interest. And we want to make sure that we are uh, correcting any earlier mistakes that we have in our field. There will be a few times throughout the semester where you really have to question and challenge some things that you believe to know about content uh, to make sure that you can approach it as a scientist with an open mind, and that's very difficult. Now there's a question of whether behavior analysis is psychology. There are some behavior analysts who are very hard line and don't believe that we should actually fit within that category of psychology. If psychology is the science of behavior and mental processes, some behavior analysts say, then we're not really in that camp, they say. They say, well, we, we really only are interested in the behavior part. Right, And that's a kind of methodological behaviorist approach. So I'm going to move forward understanding that we as behavior analysts, we do align very closely with psychology as a mainstream field of study. The difference being that we are just an extremely rigorous form of psychology. So remember, we mentioned before that behavior analysts do not, do not say that private events like thoughts and feelings don't exist. We don't say that mental processes don't exist. We simply do not use those as causal variables for the, the phenomenon that we do see happen. So as I mentioned, behavior analysis is very, very rigorous. We have a heavy emphasis on directly observable phenomena. That's why we focus on behavior rather than uh, private events like um, feelings and thoughts as our dependent variable or as our independent variable or even as mitigating features. We have very, very tight methods of achieving experimental control. We use something called within subjects design, and we're going to come back to that in a future topic. But for now, I want you to understand that we are very, very interested in making sure that we are demonstrating experimental control when we're conducting our studies. And then finally, we want to make sure that we have this ongoing critical evaluation of our independent variable and our dependent variable so that we can be sure and confident in the data that we're collecting. Now, when we talk about the goals of science, any science, it doesn't matter what it is, we're talking about four different levels of scientific understanding. Starting from the top, starting from least 
rigorous. There's description. Description is really just about telling people what's happening. What is the phenomenon? So I wake up in the morning and I say, the sky is blue. That's a description. It doesn't tell me why. It doesn't tell me how. It just says what is. And that's a beautiful place to start the experimental process, but it really tells us very little. It's telling us what's happening, not why, not how, not when is it going to happen again, just what is. Next, we come up with a potential explanation for why it's happening. So I could wake up in the morning and say, the sky is blue. That must mean that God is happy. Now, I have come up with a theory, right? I've come up with a potential hypothesis for why this is happening. And this is an explanation of a particular kind of value. I can't say it's true. I'm just positing a reason for why this should be. Next, we have prediction. So that's the next most rigorous, right? It's not perfect, but it's pretty good because with prediction, we have this way of saying like, if you see that this thing is present, then you should also see the other thing is present. So if you know one variable, you can predict the presence or absence of another variable. Prediction is pretty, pretty good. And remember, we talked a little bit ago about the fact that as a science, behavior analysis has those two goals. We want to be able to predict predict when behavior will happen. And if we're meeting our gold standard, we're going to get to the fourth level of scientific understanding, control. But not like a 1984, like twirling your mustache, mad science control. We're talking about, can we create the circumstances to produce the effect we want? Right? So for instance, with prediction, I could say that I predict if a mother smokes when she's pregnant, then her child is likely to be born underweight, right? That's a prediction. There are some mothers who smoke when they're pregnant and their babies are born real big and healthy. There are some mothers who don't smoke when they're pregnant and their babies are born real small. That's a prediction. It doesn't necessarily hold true. But as a scientist, if I want to be able to demonstrate that there's a strong causal relation between smoking when pregnant and underweight births, I would need to demonstrate that only when, or when and only when, mothers smoke when they're pregnant do we see underweight births. Now, of course, there's some ethical concerns there. You definitely couldn't run this study very easily, which is why we do sometimes run our experiments on non-human animals to see if those relationships exist. In this particular case, maybe that level of scientific control is not necessary. Maybe we're comfortable with a kind of strong predictive value, but there are definitely circumstances under which we want to be able to demonstrate with rigor. We want to be able to demonstrate that there's control between two variables. If I'm working with a client who has some very challenging behavior, I want to be able to demonstrate that when I teach that client an alternative skill that allows them to contact reinforcement and they're earning reinforcement for that alternative skill, that the problem behavior is going to decrease in frequency. So depending on what your goal is in terms of your level of understanding, you're going to look at these four different goals. Remember, from least rigorous to most rigorous, description, what's going on, explanation, a possible reason why it's happening, prediction allows you to, to determine when it might happen again, because if you know this, then you could potentially predict the next, and then finally control, being able to actually produce the phenomenon of interest. Be sure to check out the next video where we're going to be talking about what correlations tell us and how they're an example of prediction.